Hello all, my name is Will Allen, and I'll be your safari guide on this journey through Learning Jungle. Uh, this is the first in a two-part lecture series about the usage of mathematics in encryption. This first lecture is going to be about applying encryption and the mathematics behind why we use uh, the systems that we do. And then the second lecture is going to be more focused on how to reverse those encryption algorithms uh, without the key. So these two lectures are going to be directly oppositional to each other. This first one is going to be all about how we can prevent people from reading messages that we don't want them to. And the second lecture is going to be entirely about reading messages that people don't want us to. Uh, so with all that said, let's go ahead and hop in. Uh, the first uh, cipher that we're going to be talking about is the shift or the Caesar cipher. Uh, it's the easiest to understand and it's the easiest to implement. Um, as the name implies, the shift cipher simply takes each letter and shifts it over um, a couple digits in the alphabet. Uh, so for example, you could have A to B, B to C, C to D, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so here you can see we've just shifted everything up one position. Uh, so for this example, specifically, we're going to use this cipher where we've shifted everything two to the left. So A has mapped over here, uh, D has mapped over there, so now F goes to D. Uh, and then one thing worth noting is here at the end, uh, where we've got Y and Z, uh, they map, but there's nothing over here. So it actually loops all the way back to the beginning, and we've got that Y maps to the first spot and Z maps to the second spot. So A, B, C, and so on and so forth. So, uh, for example, if we've got this message, this message is easy to read now, but won't be soon. Uh, we take that first letter, that T, uh, and you can see T maps to R, so we just replace that right in there. Next up, we have H, which maps to F. Similarly, I to G. And finally, we've got S maps to Q. And so we've got that first word fully encrypted, R, F, G, Q. And so at this point, you can see we're uh, resulting in absolute utter nonsense. Uh, if you were just passing by, this wouldn't be differentiable at all from just some garbage that someone had written down. However, to somebody who's familiar with the cipher, someone who knows what they're looking at, reversing this message is quite simple. Uh, as you can see, if we take this last word right here, Q-M-M-L, uh, we've got the Q maps to S. Uh, we've got those double M's, each of which maps to an O. And then finally, we've got Q, and that Q maps back up, or sorry, we've, lastly, we've got L, and that L maps back up to an M. So as you can see, it's quite easy to reverse this encryption if you know what you're doing. Um, uh, this maps into that, and Q, M, and L maps out of it into Zoom. Uh, there's a couple of problems, though, which become pretty quickly apparent the more that you think about this uh, cipher, the most obvious of which is that because you are limited to this shift, there's actually a finite number of shift ciphers that can be used, and you can actually iterate through those pretty quickly. So you've got A maps directly to B, A maps to C, A maps to D, and so on and so forth. And so you can actually only have a total of 25 shift ciphers, uh, because A will map just to any of the other 25 letters. And then once you've done all of those, you're out of shift ciphers. Uh, and the reason that it's not 26 is because on the 26th, you would just map A directly back to itself, B would map to itself as well, uh, C, and so on. And then you're not actually encrypting anything. That's just the original message as it was before. So uh, the most obvious solution to this issue is to expand the way that we look at the shift cipher. And we instead go with the substitution cipher, where we are not limited to specifically uh, having the alphabet in order. Instead, any letter can map to any other letter, as long as that mapping is unique. So for example, S maps to A means that nothing else could. You can't have B maps to A. That's not valid. You could also. Uh, Alternatively, have B maps to C, or B maps to Z, or anything really that you wanted at all. Uh, and there's a number of ways that you can select this. Uh, you can just do it randomly. You can mash on your keyboard and take that order. Uh, you can use a code word. There's a number of different options. Uh, for this example, though, we'll be using a code word, and that code word is 
cipher. So you can see the first ones that we map is uh, the letters that are used to comprise the word cipher. So we've got A maps to C, B maps to I, uh, and so on. And then once we've done all of those, we just map the remaining letters as they are. So uh, once we've mapped all the letters of cipher, now we go just through the alphabet. We go A, B, C has already been used there. So we skip it and go directly to D. Similarly, E has already been used and we go straight to F and so on up until we reach uh, a point where all letters are just mapping back to themselves. Uh, and at first this seems like a security flaw and like it would actually be an issue. However, for example, uh, this is somewhat a good thing because let's say we have the, lower, the word two, right? If you saw that, you would have no way of knowing if it's just coincidence that those letters all map to each other. Uh, in this case, they don't, but maybe that's the original word or maybe it's and, maybe it's but, maybe it's, it's a number of things. And so you've actually added another level of obfuscation where even if you see something that looks like a word, there's no way of really knowing if that's valid. Uh, so again, pretty simple. We just take the uh, cipher that we've been given here and we follow it. So again, we've got that. This is another example, easy for now, but not for long. Uh, that first word, this, we can see T maps to T. So that T stays the same. H, however, maps to B this time. I maps to D and S maps back to S. Uh, T, B, D, S, even though uh, a lot of those letters are mapping back to themselves, the resulting word is still nonsense and it's difficult to uh, understand without actually knowing the original key. Uh, similarly, it's equally as easy to reverse it if you know what you're doing. So that last word, J-M-L-A, we have that A maps backwards into G, L maps backwards into N, M maps backwards into O, and J maps backwards into L, and you've got that word long, which is as we would expect, the last word of that original cipher. Uh, so obviously this is a lot more safe. There's many more than 25 possible substitution ciphers. And we'll get into that a little bit further in the next lecture, just talking about ways that we can attack this. But unfortunately, uh, the big flaw is that it's uh, weak to something called frequency analysis. And we'll go into more detail uh, in the next lecture. So another possible solution is instead of having the letters themselves change, what if we just change the order that they're in? And so that's the general idea behind the next cipher mechanism, which is the transposition cipher. In a transposition cipher, we essentially uh, change the letters uh, in the way that they're ordered instead of trying to change the letters themselves. Uh, because when you're changing the letters, all you need to know is what letter means what, and you can reverse that instantly. Whereas with this one, you need to know a little bit more in detail. So uh, for example, we can take the message. This message is the final example and will become equally confusing. Uh, there's 56 letters here. So we want to write this into a matrix. Uh, a nice round number close to 57 is 60. So we'll write it in a 10 by six matrix. Uh, I've gone ahead and done that preemptively. So this is our matrix right here. You can see this message uh, is the final example. Uh, and it's just written out like that. And then what we do, as the name suggests, the transposition cipher, we just take the transpose of this matrix. Before we can do that, though, you'll notice that there's these three empty spots right here. And so what we'll do is we'll actually just fill that up with garbage. Uh, we can just fill it up with Z, M, and I. Now that we've done that, we can go ahead and take the transpose of this matrix, uh, which just means instead of reading it across like that, we'll read it down. So the resulting message is T E L D E N H I E W E F I S X I Q, U. And as you can see, already we've we've run into something that's clearly nonsense. Um, but 
As we continue through this path, we'll notice that if we keep these spaces here to indicate where the rows begin and end, it actually becomes incredibly simple, both to recognize that this is the cipher being used and to decode it. We just take the first letter of each one, T, H, I, and then the next one would obviously start with S. So we would have this uh, and we would already be most of the way there towards uh, actually completing the cipher. So uh, what is pretty common practice is instead of including these spaces, uh, you'll actually, to add another level of confusion into the mix, uh, you'll put the spaces where they don't belong. So for example, to indicate that maybe this is a three by 20 matrix instead, you would put the space there. So TEL space DEN. And as you can see, this appears the exact same to us since we know that it was used in this manner. However, to an eavesdropper who isn't familiar with what we're using or uh, the size of the matrix, they would take a look at this and they would say, well, this is pretty clearly three letter words consistently. So we're looking at likely a transposition cipher. And they would take a look at that first letter, T, D, H, W, absolute nonsense. And so just sort of adds another level of confusion into anyone who's trying to read the message without the proper authority. Uh, unfortunately, frequency analysis, that method that I had mentioned earlier as a possible solution to uh, the substitution cipher also comes into, uh, comes into the, the works here uh, and does cause similar issues. So let's take a look at more mathematical options. Um, specifically, let's talk about modular arithmetic. Now, it's likely that uh, in previous classes or previous experience, you've come in contact with the modulus operator. Uh, however, the modular uh, operator is incredibly important for modern encryption uh, mechanisms. So for the sake of review, uh, we're actually going to go ahead and go over that real quick. But the first part of this is going to be much more review than actually new things. Uh, so just as a quick reminder, uh, the modulus, often written as some number percent another number, so for example, 3% 2, is just the remainder after division. So you've got 3 divided by 2 is equal to 1 and a half. Uh, and so this half right there is the remainder. So it's actually one plus one. So we take that remainder. So three mod two is one. Um, alternatively, you've got 23 mod four. Uh, as you can see, uh, 20 evenly divides that and we've got three, which doesn't have a good remainder. So that remainder would be three. So 23 mod four is three. Uh, specifically, we say that two numbers are congruent modulo something. Uh, so in this case, we would say 23 and 3 are congruent mod 4. Uh, and that's just sort of the, the language that we're going to use when we're talking about this. And the reason that that's all important is because we can define something called a generator. Uh, and an integer is a generator if g to the n produces all possible numbers between 1 and p minus 1 uh, if, when we take that modulus p. Uh, so for example, we've got the generator 5 and the prime number 7. In this case, we would say that 5 is a generator for the prime number 7. And the reason that that is, is because if we examine this table here, we've got 5 to the first power is equal to 5. Mod 7 is obviously 5. Then we've got 5 squared, which is 25. And then when we take the remainder of that with respect to 7, 7 times 3 is 21. So we've got that remainder is 4. Uh, similarly, uh, 125 has a remainder of 6. 625 has a remainder of 2. And so on, all the way down until we get 5 to the 6th power, which has a remainder of 1. Uh, and then were we to take 5 to the 7th power, we would actually find that the remainder of that uh, modulo 7 is just 5 again. So for this reason, modular arithmetic is sometimes called clock arithmetic because it's cyclical like that. And you can see uh, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 
six is all numbers between one and seven minus one. So we can say very confidently that five is a generator for the prime number seven. Uh, this isn't always the case, however, as you can see in this instance, uh, where the generator is five and the prime number is 11. Uh, five to the one, again, we've got that remainder of five. In this case, we've got 25. Uh, obviously, 11 times two is 22, so we get that remainder of three. Uh, 11 times 11 is 121, so we get that remainder of four for n equals three. And then we actually see uh, remainder of nine for the next one, remainder of one, and then we're back to that remainder of five for five to the sixth. So we've actually made the entire leap, and we've not hit a number of items that we would need to in order for five to be a generator. Specifically, we never saw a remainder of two, six, seven, eight, or ten. None of those were ever hit. Uh, and an important thing to note about this process is it's incredibly easy to figure out which of these numbers you end up with. So if I said, we've got a generator, five, and we've got a prime number, seven, and n is, for example, three, what's our remainder? The answer is, quite obviously, six. Not difficult at all. Uh, we can just take five to the third power modulo seven. However, if I were to say, we've got a prime number, five, and we've got, it's a generator for the prime number, seven, and we've raised it to some power, and that results in six, what is the power that we raised it to? And the answer is, it's impossible to know unless we try every single option until we find one that works. And so for this reason, uh, modular exponentiation is called a one-way function. There is a very simple solution done one way, but done the other way, there is no possible solution other than trial and error, just trying every single option and seeing which one works. Uh, so make sure to tuck that away in the back of your mind. That's going to be incredibly important um, for uh, the next lecture that we go into. However, before we can go into how that affects arithmetic, how that arithmetic inf affects encryption and that sort of thing, we need to talk about two pretty important rules. Uh, the first one is the modular exponentiation rule. And the modular exponentiation rule just says that a to the b mod n is the same thing as a mod n to the b mod n. And so that just makes it a little bit easier to calculate. Sometimes we can take that exponent out of the parentheses. Um, and the reason that that's true is because according to the quotient remainder theorem, we can express every number a as the multiples of two numbers plus whatever the remainder is. And so this just means that a is congruent to r mod n. You can see there's some aspect of it that n goes into, and then there's that remainder. So with that in mind, what we can do is we can actually substitute this bit in for a into the equation. And so when we do that on the left-hand side, we have that a is equal to m times n plus b or sorry, plus r to the b mod n. And then what we can do is we can just use binomial expansion uh, to get all of the different values that that uh, exponent goes to. So specifically, we've got b choose 0, n to the b r to the 0. Uh, that r to the 0 just cancels. Uh, then we've got b choose 1, n to the b minus 1, times r to the 1, and so on and so forth, all the way until we get to b choose b, n to the 0, r to the b. And that, uh, again, cancels. It goes to 1. Uh, and then we take all of this, mod n. Uh, and something very special here happens. Uh, we can see that this 
is a multiple of n. It must be because one of the factors is n to the b. Again, this is a factor of n and so on and so forth. So this term actually goes to zero when taking uh, the modulus with respect to n. This one as well goes to zero. The next one, the next one, and so on, all the way until we get to this very last term where n is to the zero power. And we don't have it as a factor at all. In this case, we have b choose b, which is equal to one, and r to the b, which is equal to r to the b, obviously. And we get that everything in those parentheses just reduces down to r to the b mod n. And so we see that everything in there goes away. All that, all that nonsense goes away because we've got mod n. And then if we examine the other side, uh, this side right here, uh, we similarly see when we replace a with n times m plus r, again, that one goes to zero, the r remains, and again, we just have r to the b mod n. And so we can see at the end, those two terms end up being equivalent, and we can feel fairly confident that this statement is true. And somewhat an expansion of that idea is the modular exponent power rule. We'll get to that here in just a second. We've got the modular exponent power rule, which just states uh, that for any natural numbers, we've got that a to the b mod n to the c mod n. Uh, and the reason that those uh, it's mod n twice is uh, essentially just an expansion of this theorem here. You can see we've got mod n in there twice. Uh, a, a lot of this theorem is just an expansion of the previous one. Uh, that's the same as if we had uh, b and c both inside the parentheses, and if we had c inside the parentheses and b outside the parentheses. You can see that uh, this, this theorem is very much just an expansion of the modular exponentiation rule. Uh, so once we've got a firm understanding of those two, we can jump into the most classic example of uh, encryption, which is the Alice and Bob paint example. So in this case, Alice and Bob uh, both agree on a common paint. In this case, the common paint uh, would be some prime generator P and the prime itself P. They both take their secret colors. We'll call Alice's secret color lowercase a, and we'll call Bob's secret color lowercase b. So now at this point, Alice has the generator g to the a, and Bob has the generator g to the b. And then what they do is they take the modulus with respect to that common prime. So now both of them have g to the their power mod p. Similarly here, we've got g to the b mod p. Now what they can do is they can just exchange the values that they have. Uh, and obviously, since it is a one-way function, we know that seeing orange isn't going to tell you that you started with yellow or that you started with red. Neither of those are going to be able to be observed just because you've got orange paint uh, separation is expensive. Uh, so now they've switched. Alice has g to the b mod p, and Bob has g to the a mod p. Now again, they add that same secret color that they added above. and they take the modulus with respect to that prime number again. So now Bob has g to the a mod p to the b mod p, and Alice has g to the b mod p raised to the power a mod p. And as we see above, both of those can be simplified by bringing the external exponent into that parentheses. And when we do that, we see something pretty obvious which is that both end up with the same value, g to the a times b mod p. So they end up with this shared common secret that only they know because only they have access to that initial uh, prime generator g and prime number p. 
Uh, and even if it were the case that someone were to understand that and gain access to those values, they still wouldn't be able to end up with this common secret because they don't know anything about what got them to the point here, and they have no way of adding that special number that brings these to the same value together without having uh, knowledge that would make them qualified to receive that message. So that's going to be all for this lecture on applying encryption. Uh, I'll be with you next time uh, in order to provide instructions on removing encryption. And I hope you enjoyed yourself and you had a lot of fun. Thank you.